Hello everyone, welcome back to Poetry Surprises and uh, today we're going to have a slightly nostalgic journey back into the past. Uh, about 20 years ago I was asked by the Scottish Arts Council to make a series of films on poets. Uh, they were going to be 10 minute films and uh, I could sort of choose who I wanted and I wanted to make sure that they were writers local to Galloway uh, where I live. And one of those writers, and we will be seeing the others in due course as well, I hope, one of those writers was a poet who had of a huge stature, uh, in my opinion, uh, very important to Scottish writing in the 20th century, uh, and that was William Neal. Now, Willie, as he was affectionately known, uh, used to teach at Castle Douglas High School, which uh, is um, well, a few hundred yards from here, where I'm sitting. And he lives a few miles up the road, or he lived a few miles up the road. He died 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, in some ways, you know, this belied his uh, reputation and his achievement as a poet, because people used to refer to him as Willie, and he was a bit, you know, uh, known as a, uh, a bit of a, a difficult character at times. And I was certainly wary going to make a film about Willie Neal, uh, you know, me, a Londoner with the wrong accent, but he, you know, he was absolutely brilliant, as you will see in the film. Uh, uh, a, a real character. Uh, I'd known him for a while and I'd published a lot of his work uh, through uh, the, uh, the magazine I used to edit at the time. Uh, but just to give you some representation of the kind of stature that I had, um, this is... Um, uh, uh, translations into Italian of, of Willie's work um, called Stagione and uh, here uh, is translations into Danish of his work. Um, I won't try to print that, well, Tidzler, Tidzler, I, I, sorry I don't know what it means but uh, it was Willie that gave it to me, signed copy, really sweet. Um, and. Uh, he was a great sonneteer. He loved the sonnet, which has uh, been very influential on me. Uh, so, you know, Just Sonnets, uh, one of his uh, books. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot in there. Um, and what's more, he used the Petrarchan sonnet quite frequently, uh, which we will come on to in, in a future edition of this, um, of, of uh, Poetry Surprises. Um, I remember joking with him once that uh, I always, whenever I went into a bookshop, he was always sitting next to Neruda because of the, the, the uh, Neil Neruda alphabetical organisation, which he found um, amusing. Uh, and um, uh, with his sort of self-deprecating wit, he also uh, felt that, you know, he'd probably never quite make it to that standard. But, you know, this is a, he's a, he's a significant writer. In, in, in Scottish literary canon. Um, uh, there's been some lovely work done on his also uh, with, um, I think I launched this in Dumfries and Galloway, an event uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, and uh, his work has also been illustrated. It's called Galloway Landscapes. And, you know, there are these lovely woodcuts. Um, and the woodcuts are by Stan Dobbin and uh, you know, there's beautifully printed uh, poetry by, by Willie in, in here. Um, so the film I did, I actually shot in my kitchen, uh, partly, um, at the time. And, um, well, I think, you know, uh, let's, let's take a look at it and uh, uh, maybe let me know what you think. Uh, but um, uh, anyway, this is a tribute to Willie Nil. Thank you. The true vision is something to do with meaning what you say inside as well as saying it. There are a lot of things that are, are obviously true and you just see them. If something is good then you see that it's good, you should do it all the time. And if, if, if something isn't good, you should avoid it like the plague. 
From the cell window past the prison gable, he saw the topmost branches of a tree, watched them each day as long as he was able, the only living freedom he could see. His spirit failed him at the chainsaw's roar on the grey morning that they cut it down, till he recalled what had been there before and closed his eyes to watch its leafy crown. I suppose it has its basis in a kind of Buddhist view of things. Um, we're not different, we're, we're all atoms and molecules and so are they and we're all part of it to the utter end of the universe sort of thing. It makes me feel, feel better about myself. <laughs> uh, Yes, Treen, the gale was rattle and glass and sclate. I had the muckle dunt in the mirk nicht, an oory thing, I walk into the fricht, grup it I thought atween the shears of fate. It wasn't a cloth, though, making a less date, as I could plainly see in the morn's licht. Yon muckle ache that stood so strang and ticht, by yon, by on a janner blessed was the beat. I hake it. Men like aches, he felt the dunt made on the human spirit when they fell, who are fit mech tramp on tatmest branch and writ, whiles the sick trunk shall see a burkey strunt and brag as if he broke it down himself, but done a kick for fear he'll stave his fit. I, I always grew exasperated by people who believe too firmly, firmly in their own brand of religion to the damnation of everything else and the bafflement of <laughs> most of humanity. They never, they never stick to what the original prophet was saying. That, that's much too difficult. Oh dear. Uh, they, 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 read, <laughs> they read the original prophet and they stick to the fringe bits that they can be bigoted about. <laughs> <laughs> I've had one or two spats with holy men on account of this particular thing. Uh, and I find, as a matter of fact, I find clergymen, most clergymen are quite re quite repulsive in this respect, that they expect you to believe one type of miracle, but, not, but if you happen to mention one which they don't have, uh, that becomes heresy or something like that. Whereas, it seems to me, that Buddhism doesn't do this, it doesn't ask you to believe the absurdities, it just asks you to see. And if you don't see, well, no, it only blames you, you don't say it's a sin, but you should try to see things. Buddha is the sort of bloke I'd have liked to have met. <laughs> when you get away from the vulgar tongue, and by this I really mean the vulgar tongue, and when you get away from it, you, it loses bite. You can't express yourself. Uh, you, you know what I mean if you hear a street trader of some kind having an altercation with somebody in his own tongue, and it, it's, it's impossible to put, to put the same feeling in, in standard English. He merged about the gutters of Marbury and he'd Three medals on his breast and the pipe sound and four, four free wipers and the bloody song in this land fit for hearers to stare in. I couldn't pass him on a Saturday, I took gain up my hard one penny. You're daft, said my old mother, he'll spin it on the drink, but I couldn't just give by him. Yin's pipes a blow his octor, he heard the rattle of my alms in his tinny. He cried out after me, and either an ace or a blessing. My tackets dented on the cosy as I ran, a war, a war for a can of water in his in. If I write satire, I'm tempted to write in Scots. Middle English 
as a, as a bite, you could use Middle English to write satire in. Modern English is not so good. You can't, you don't, it hasn't got the same bite, whereas Scots, I think, has retained the bite. They used to stop kids from saying, I, and I used to say to my classes, I is a perfectly good English word, said I, and if you go into the Navy and you can't say, I, I, sir, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> oh yes, I'm very fond of sonnets. I like, I like the sonnet form. Of course, I, I, I like Ottavarima as well because I like Byron, who always wrote out of Arima, but um, as a matter of fact, to tell you the truth, I have got a thing about verse which not everybody agrees with, and that is that I think that one of the things that verse that is important to verse, and I have quarrelled with poets time and again about this, is that verse as, a, as opposed to prose, requires that it has markers in it. It, it. it has to have have the structure, memorable structure, and it's the structure that makes it memorable. Uh, like, uh, it's like you take any nursery rhyme, you like Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. It has form because it has, and its memorability is important because Humpty Dumpty. There isn't a kid who doesn't know about Humpty Dumpty and he, and he knows it because it's memorable verse because it's patterned verse, it has a pattern and that's one of the things that's important. I mean nobody can hear the Ode to a Nightingale without some kind of vision that this is poetry. It really is poetry. Uh, you can eat, smell and see and touch the things in that poem and he could do that. Wordsworth has the same quality except when he's, when he's being deliberately religious, when he gets on my nerves. I mean they wiped out whole species of birds. This place, Kukubri and Ayrshire, used to be alive in, with lapwings, peewits as we call them. Yeah. And the, the whole sky would be alive with them, it's flashes of white. See, if you see something in the very special sense that you of knowing that this is right. On the hill slope, man merges into trees, loses particular, melts to stone and grass, where following breezes lend him a swift ease, and as he strides on past, so all things pass. All blood and sap beats warmly through one heart, all sight is gathered unto the falling sun, no leg or stalk or trunk that moves apart, the sinews of all being move as one. The vein runs crystal, blood flows in the stream, blossom on flesh and bush, sky set in gold, eye that sleeps sound within a waking dream, true power all motion in his cupped hands hold, in a warm grasp that merges heart and mind, all separateness turned to a common kind. <laughs>